where nature inspires incredible thinking. Where ingenuity drives innovation. And productivity. Where big ideas are born every day and new technologies are perfected. Where the impossible becomes real. And where every sunrise inspires the extraordinary. Welcome to the country of open spaces, open hearts, and open minds. Together, we can do amazing things. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Jansen, and hopefully you can all hear me okay. I'm going to be presenting to you for the next 60 minutes or so. <clears throat> so just a little bit of uh, housekeeping, I guess. Um, today's seminar will last for roughly 60 minutes. It might be <clears throat> a little short of that. Excuse my voice, very early morning here. Um, there will be a further 20 minutes for questions at the end of the session as well. You can post your questions through the chat panel. I'm not sure if the actual Q&A panel is working at the moment. Um, let me just start my timer so that I don't run over time. <clears throat> um, if you are posting a question, please keep it general or generic. Uh, it's very hard for me to answer questions that are very specific to you during an event like this. Um, so keep them fairly general, and that way everyone gets a little bit of benefit out of it as well. If for any reason you are disconnected in any stage, you can use the same link to come back uh, and rejoin the event. <clears throat> Please keep your microphone muted. I have set them to mute, but um, if for any reason it becomes unmuted, just keep it muted just so uh, everybody uh, don't have too many voices all talking at once. All right. So we've got a fair bit to cover in 60 odd minutes, and we're going to start off with a little bit of a short introduction to life in New Zealand, the here and the now, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <clears throat> I guess one thing you'll hopefully pick up from my presentation is that I like to tell people how it is. Uh, making a move to another country is a really big deal. Um, and, you know, New Zealand is a great place to live. It's a fantastic country, um, great little uh, slice of paradise down the bottom of the earth. But we have our issues, we have our problems, and, and no doubt you will have seen some of that in recent media. I guess <clears throat> this presentation is all about perspective. So it's making sure that people have the right perspective when they do consider making this move. It isn't, uh, you know, a honeymoon or a holiday. This is a, a, a permanent life move. So it's really important, I think, that you get to know everything about New Zealand, a little bit about everything anyway. So we'll cover off some of those key things. Then we're gonna dive into the visa overview, how our visa system works, the different streams of visas available. Um, it's a very broad outline of some of the key terms and processes that we have. And then we'll start getting into the detail, which <clears throat> we'll initially start with family, and business visas, which uh, we won't spend too much time on because we want to move reasonably quickly to the skilled migrant part of this discussion, which is really the main uh, visa category for people. It's the, the nuts and bolts of our visa process and where we get the vast majority of our, our migrants from. 
And then finally, we'll talk through what a successful migration looks like um, <clears throat> and what, what it takes to be successful in this process and then your next move. So having listened to me, if you think that this is a, something you want to do, uh, what do you do next? What's your next step from here? All right, so what I might do is just turn off the video for a moment, <clears throat> just so you can see the full screen. You don't have my uh, talking head in the background. Um, and we'll get stuck into a little bit of a new overview as to New Zealand and, and what's going on here at the moment. And probably the biggest one um, for all of you, or those of you certainly looking to come here and seek out employment, is employment and, and what that's doing. So currently unemployment remains very, very low, about 3.1%. Um, which for some of you living in certain countries will be phenomenally low. That's a really, really low number. Um, and it's so low that it's creating more problems than benefits. Typically, a, a low unemployment number is a really good thing. Um, but in the context of the current labour market, we have very severe skill shortages pretty much in almost every industry. Now, of course, that will change and, and employment or unemployment is not a static number. So the next 12 to 24 months will be really important uh, in terms of using unemployment or employment to tackle inflationary pressure here in New Zealand. I think what's really key for you to know if you're looking at making this move is the fact that um, there are really good job opportunities here in almost every sector of the market. So we have IT professionals, engineers, teachers, marketing, finance. People are finding jobs because there are a lot of jobs to find. Um, and obviously, when it comes to making this move, for many of you, having a job will be really important. So understanding the market and being able to tap into that market when it's um, hot is a really good thing. Education and healthcare. <clears throat> Education and healthcare are taxpayer funded for the most part, starting when you secure a work visa. So once you have a work visa here, your children's education is fully funded and your healthcare is funded as well. And it's quite generous in terms of how many countries operate their visa process. So a lot of people you know, who move to various parts of the world may not experience that free education and healthcare upfront and may have to wait until they get residence. In New Zealand, we, we start that from the day you become a taxpayer, basically. So when you're paying taxes, you do have access to education and healthcare, which is a really big benefit for, for people coming to make the move here because it's often a two-stage process and you may need to be on that work visa for a period of time. Property, I often get asked, you know, how much does it cost or is it expensive? It isn't cheap. Property in New Zealand is reasonably expensive, particularly in places like Auckland, uh, where we do have, you know, very, very hot property market and demand often outstrips supply. Uh, but that is cooling off a little bit now. We are seeing prices reduce as inflation hits in and interest rates go up. Our interest rates at the moment between 5 and 6%. Um, so it really depends on where you're looking to buy, what kind of property you're looking to buy as well. Um, for most of my clients, what generally tends to happen <clears throat> is they come across, they're renting for a while, they secure their residence, and then eventually they buy a property. So buying a property is not something you necessarily do straight away. Um, you need to settle here, and often you need to recover financially from the move as well. Cost of living, like most countries, New Zealand is struggling with an increasing cost of living uh, in the post-pandemic world where governments flooded economies with plenty of cash to keep things going during the pandemic. Uh, and that has now kind of turned <clears throat> on its head and we do have increasing cost of living. But, you know, again, for most people earning a good income, if you're skilled, if you've got a reasonably good job, it's a manageable thing and certainly no worse than plenty of other places around the planet. Um, so it all depends on what your, your lifestyle is like. And as we've seen over time, the cost of living and inflationary pressures will change <clears throat> and eventually sort of rebalance themselves. So there's a few things to think about. And look, I don't want to spend too long um, talking through what New Zealand is all about. Um, often most people have made that decision or have at least started that research themselves. But when we have a one-to-one -one discussion, which is the kind of next step after the seminar, <clears throat> we go through a lot of these things and what your income will translate to in terms of a cost, cost of living basis, 
um, buying property, but particularly the job search. So I'm not a recruiter. I don't find people jobs, but I certainly help a lot of my clients in that job search process, which <clears throat> largely translates to you know, being able to identify, excuse me, <clears throat> opportunities for them where they might sort of put their energies, where they might look, what sort of salaries they might be aiming for, all of those kind of support factors. And, and also working on people's CVs is a really basic thing. Um, I often get asked, is there a New Zealand style CV? No, there isn't. Um, we don't have a New Zealand style CV. A lot of industries will have sort of different needs or different demands for different CVs. But there are some basic rules, and so we assist our clients a lot with that job search process in terms of the support side of things. Finding work, <clears throat> I often get asked, how do you find a job in New Zealand? You know, what, is, what is the magic formula? And the simple fact is there isn't one, there isn't a magic formula, so to speak. There is a lot of different avenues you can pursue, a lot of different um, pathways, a lot of different tools you can deploy. And so <clears throat> really the key is getting your name out there knowing when to market yourself, where to market yourself and how. Um, and so we support people with a lot of that as well. So that's a bit of a New Zealand overview. We'll now move on to a little bit of an overview as to how our visa process works and just a couple of really basic things. So we have two kinds of visas really in New Zealand. We have temporary visas, which are things like work visas, student visas or visitor visas, and then we have a residence class visa. So you'll often hear words like temporary visa, and that's what that refers to. It's a fixed period of time. So maybe you come to work in New Zealand for three years, or you study here for one year, or you visit here for six months. So they have a fixed finite lifespan. <clears throat> um, and then we have the resident visa on the other side, which is the permanent visa. That's really what you're aiming for to be able to live, work, and study in New Zealand indefinitely. <clears throat> um, and one often leads to the other. So in order to secure residence, often what you need to do is you need to be able to secure a temporary visa to start with, which will then lead you on to residence as well. So we'll talk a little bit more <clears throat> about how that all works um, as the seminar moves ahead. So it's just a basic overview as to how the, the visa process works. In terms of residence, and when we talk about it being permanent, New Zealand is a little bit unique in that respect. Um, so when you secure a residence visa, we give it to you for um, forever. So if you're in New Zealand and you secure residence, you are entitled to stay here until your very last day, your very last breath. <clears throat> but initially what we do is we say to you, we give you this visa with a period of two years worth of travel conditions. Um, and often people get this confused because the initial visa is called a residence visa. And then after that two year period of travel conditions, you can apply for a permanent residence visa. The biggest difference between the two is those travel conditions. So on a permanent residence visa, <clears throat> your travel conditions never expire. So effectively you could come and go as often as you like. And every time you come back, you're a New Zealand resident once more. So for the first two years, there's a few criteria you have to meet or one of five criteria that you have to meet in order to make it permanent. <clears throat> and the really simple, easiest one to meet is to remain in New Zealand for a certain period of time for each year. So if you do half of year one and half of year two physically in New Zealand, then you'll be able to apply for permanent residence, which is a very <clears throat> quick and easy application to make. It takes only you know, a couple of weeks. There's very few documents to provide. So a little bit of a, I guess, clarification of what we mean by residence. But for those coming here to work and to live and to settle, um, securing permanent residence is a very easy thing to do once you've got your residence. And residence itself gives you all the rights, the access, the abilities, the privileges that um, I have effectively as a citizen, just a few things you can't do. Um, you <clears throat> can't participate in uh, certain government jobs or government sector jobs or the, or the Commonwealth Games or the Olympics. Um, most of my clients don't have a worry with that, but you can vote, you can buy property, you pay the same taxes, you essentially live the same way I do. Um, you don't <clears throat> secure a passport yet that comes five years after being a resident. So 
Often it's temporary visa first, that leads on to residence, and then you end up going on to citizenship after five years of being a resident. Um, and many of you will want to become a citizen, that will be something you want to pursue, um, but residence is a pretty good first step. It gives you all the, the access to what you would ordinarily need. Um, and just before we get on to the kind of more technical part of it in terms of the actual visas, we do um, treat everyone or a family package for the residence process. So temporary visas are often individual. So one person might get a work visa, then the children, student visas, and the partner, a visitor visa or work visa. Um, and they're all applied for individually. Um, but for residents, it's a package deal. So when we bundle everyone up to apply for residence, that includes the main applicant, so the person who qualifies against the rules. Um, and then we include the partner and dependent children in that application. So everyone applies together. Just on the, on the two things there, so partnership um, and also dependent children, when we talk about partners, we're not necessarily talking about um, having to be married. Um, you can be de facto relationship, same-sex relationship, civil union, um, married, unmarried, doesn't really matter as long as you've been living together for one year. So that is the basic rule for immigration, including a partner. If you have lived in the nature of a marriage, but not necessarily married uh, for at least 12 months, then you can include your partner into that equation. When it comes to dependent children, it's a little bit more complicated. So for residents, the age, cutoff age for dependent children is 25 years. So if they reach the age of 25, if they've turned 25, then your children can no longer be included in that residence visa application. Up to the age of 25, they can be included, but they need to be dependent on you. And that effectively means they need to, you need to be supporting them financially, um, they need to be living with you, they need to be single and have no children of their own. Um, often we get older children, 22, 23, who don't want to move, who say, no, I'm not, not, not going to the other side of the world. Um, but we bundle them in anyway, because the reason being is they don't necessarily have to move straight away. Um, they can do a very short trip here. Uh, and then effectively they can secure that permanent residence alongside the rest of the family. So it's really important to assess their situation really carefully to make sure we leave no one behind. So that's a little bit of <clears throat> background to how the visa process works. And now we'll talk a little bit more about the, the individual categories. And I want to go through these five um, categories fairly quickly because they probably won't apply to most of you. Um, we will get to the, the skilled migrant part of the equation in a little bit, um, and that's probably where the bulk of you will fit. So in terms of the parent category, we actually have two of them. Uh, there is a parent category, kind of a general parent category, and then we have a parent retirement category as well. So the parent category, which is a ballot-driven system, that effectively means you put your hat into the ring, uh, and then immigration does a selection process from there and picks parents out. Now, the most important thing in, in terms of that parent category is that the parent must have an adult child who is sponsoring them. Um, that adult child must have lived in New Zealand for three years before the parent applies. The income requirements for the for the sponsor, for the adult child who is sponsoring, have recently been reduced, um, not by a massive amount, but by enough. They were very high previously, and the whole category has actually only just opened up. It opened up in October. It was, for the previous four or five years, completely closed down. So there's a kind of, I guess, a transitional period at the moment where people who previously submitted an expression of interest, because it's a two-part process, um, are being slowly selected out of that queue, and then new applications or new expressions of interest will be selected from August of next year. So effectively, if you are in that parent situation, you put your expression of interest into the system, um, and then immigration will, will select from that randomly. There's no order of events. Um, if you submit your EOI first, it doesn't mean you're selected first. 
you're basically selected on a almost random basis. So it can be pretty lengthy <clears throat> to get through, um, but it is very much a viable option for parents who are looking to make the move and follow their adult children across. We then have the second one, which is the parent retirement category, a little bit different because it relies on the parents having a certain amount of money to invest in New Zealand. And that is $1 million invested into New Zealand for a four year period. Um, and then they also need to have half a million dollars in what we call settlement funds, which are funds to essentially look after the, the person while they're settling in, um, and then an annual income of $60,000. Most importantly, the settlement funds and the annual income only have to be available when you apply. They don't actually have to be there when you get your residence, just the million has to be invested um, and invested for that four year period. Really important distinction between that one and the one before is that the child, the adult child, does not have to be in New Zealand for a certain period of time. So, for example, if you have a child, adult child, who's moved to New Zealand and they get their residence today, you could apply under the parent category, parent retirement category, the next day. Um, no minimum time period involved for the adult child to be here. Partnership, <clears throat> this really rely, relies on those who are in a genuine and stable relationship with a New Zealand citizen or resident visa holder. So if you are living with or have lived with a New Zealand citizen or New Zealand resident, you can secure partnership residence. The, the main criteria for this, again, goes back to <clears throat> that 12 months living together period. So having lived with someone for a year, um, not necessarily being married or um, in a de facto relationship, as long as you've lived with the person for 12 months. Um, now, <clears throat> a lot of people don't or can't achieve that because obviously if you're in another country and the New Zealander is here, it's very hard to live together. So often these partnership applications are kind of split into two parts. There is a temporary visa to bring someone across and they then live with their partner for that 12 months and then we apply for residence. Um, most important thing there is immigration takes a very, very close uh, look <clears throat> at the relationship. So they want to make sure it's genuine, that you do live together, that you have a relationship and that you have a level of financial interdependence. Basically means you, you share costs and maybe you share the upbringing of children and so forth. So it's not necessarily about loads and loads of paper. It's more about the quality of that evidence. Um, you can have 100 pieces of paper that really don't show much, or you can have 20 pieces of paper that are really clear and show the relationship. But it's hard, right? Proving your relationship, even if I think about it, proving the relationship to my wife might be a little bit difficult to do in terms of paper. Um, so putting those applications together is <clears throat> quite complicated um, and requires a lot of, of patience um, and being a bit clever about what you present. All right, and then the fourth one on there is the investor category, um, which really, it has changed recently. In fact, as, as recent as September of this year, when we rolled out a very new investor category, very, very challenging. Um, and these two last ones, I will admit, are not the easiest uh, applications in the world to make. <clears throat> so the investor category that we have now called the Active Investor Plus is quite a, Quite a complicated set of rules, but in short, you need to have somewhere in the region of five million dollars as a minimum to make this work, and that's quite quite a lot. Um, you know, for many people in different parts of the world, exchange rates will have a massive impact on their ability to qualify for that. Um, it's going through, I think, a bit of a test period. I don't think we'll see it last forever. I suspect we will see it changed at some point in the future. Um, to be a little bit more flexible. So it used to be 3 million, <clears throat> then in September was changed to 5 million. They've had so far one applicant, which is not a lot. So stay tuned on that. That is very likely to be adjusted in the next 12 to 24 months. Um, and then the final one on there is entrepreneur. So if you're looking to establish a business in New Zealand or maybe buy a business that's already here and operating, this would be the category for you. I, I would say, however, and it's rare <clears throat> that I tell people not to apply for a visa, but this is the one that I would normally discourage people from applying for. Um, it's notoriously difficult 
um, has about a 98% decline rate um, and immigration doesn't or no longer gets a lot of these applications through. And, and the main reason is that immigration is really looking for <clears throat> a very specific kind of business, a very um, innovative, high growth uh, business with, with potentially export potential as well, which is not the easiest thing in the world <clears throat> to, to do um, or to establish. And because of that failure rate, I tend to look at any other option I can for an applicant to avoid that particular pathway. Once you have residence in New Zealand, then <clears throat> obviously if you want to set up a business, you absolutely can. So often if you can get residence through any other means, that is the smarter way to do it. Um, and it means you can secure a residence directly um, and then run a business and, and do your own thing. Take the risk out of that equation. All right, <clears throat> so that was again just a bit of a background to some of the other categories of visa that we have. And just as a reminder, if you have questions, please post them through the chat. Um, and when we get to the end of the seminar, then I will address some of those questions for you. I've had uh, several questions sent in to me as well, so we'll go through those um, and have a look at some of those as well. All right. So now we get to the real, I guess the real key part of this uh, the seminar, which is the skilled migrant category. Um, it's where we get the largest number of migrants from or through, um, and has been in operation for many, many, many years. It's a very uh, interesting period at the moment because the skilled migrant category is subject to or undergoing some change. And so what we're going to do is talk about the skilled migrant category now, uh, and then we'll talk about the skilled migrant category in the future. So we have a current skilled migrant category, which will be um, revised or polished up, I guess, from mid 2023. But right now we have a current skilled migrant category system, or two of them, in fact, which are in existence until about, yeah, about June 23. And we'll also go through what those proposed changes will look like. I think one of the key things here is that there is a real window of opportunity between now and June to pursue residence under the skilled migrant category based on the rules that you know. Um, the proposed rules are just that, they're just proposed at this point in time. We don't, we have an idea as to what the government wants to do, but we, we don't know for certain if that's what they will do. So for the next seven or eight months, we have a policy that we know, we, we know how many points are required, we know what's involved and how it works. And so for many people, taking advantage of the rules as they are today might actually be the smarter move um, as, to, as opposed to waiting for what might come down the line. And if you put that together with unemployment being a 3.1%, <clears throat> and most, most skilled migrants need a job offer to qualify, in fact, all of them do, um, then you kind of have a really good mix, but not without its risk. There's, there are, of course, risks involved in that, um, but the timing is not bad. You've got an eight month window to use the rules that we know as they are, and we have a really good job market as well. So for many people, the next eight months will be crucial in terms of deciding whether or not to take the, the leap um, to make the jump and to actually do this process. Not to say that from mid 23, we won't be able to do that for you, but it will be a different system. And obviously with, with a different system comes greater level of risk. So I want to try and do this um, for those of you who are interested with the rules that we know. So let's, let's talk through those. So we actually have two skilled migrant category systems. Um, <clears throat> one had the first one skilled migrant category with points has been in the system, has been around for decades, been around for a very long time, but has gone through some changes recently, and we'll talk through those. And then we have another category, or another system, which is called the Skilled Migrant Residence Program, which doesn't involve points. Um, not very creative names, unfortunately, they're kind of you know, often confused between the two, um, but they are quite different. So we'll start with the skilled migrant category point system, and as it, as it is there, points, so it uses a points or a pass mark to determine if someone is eligible or not. Um, and currently the pass mark is 180 points. It was 160 points, but this category of visa was on hold throughout COVID, so basically wasn't operating for two and a half years, and was reopened only in October of this year. 
Um, at which point, when the government reopened it, they started with 160 points. And then from the 11th of November, they've moved that to 180 points. And the reality is, and the reason why it's gone to 180 points, is to kind of slow things down a little bit until they reach their new policy in 2023. The reality is most of my clients, in fact, all of my clients can still reach 180 points, but it probably means securing a job offer outside of Auckland. You get extra points for that. Um, so it's pushing more migrants into the regions, which is, in fact, not a bad idea um, for the regions. So the uh, smaller parts of the country where we still have really good job opportunities, but more so for the migrant because it's cheaper. It's cheaper to live somewhere that isn't Auckland than Auckland. Auckland is an expensive, big city. Um, you've got your commute. You've got all your um, issues with housing and cost of affordability. So if you secure a job somewhere like Hamilton or Christchurch or even Wellington, for that matter, um, you will pay a little bit less to live there. So how does it work? Um, it's really simple in a lot of ways, but complicated in others. So you do get points for things like your qualifications, your skilled work experience, your job offer in New Zealand, your age, um, a whole range of factors get mixed together. There's roughly 16 different factors you can use to get you to the 180 points. But the lion's share, the bulk of those points generally tend to come from a job offer. So a job offer in New Zealand is worth 50 points. A job offer outside of Auckland is worth 80 points. So that's almost half of the 180 you need. Generally, the right kind of applicant would have at least a diploma, um, be sort of within that 45 to 50 uh, age points or 45 to 50 years of age for points, um, have good level of work experience um, in a skilled occupation. We'll talk about what skilled means. Um, and then have that job offer outside of Auckland, and that will get you to the number you need. <clears throat> so, you know, really the biggest difference between the pass mark at 160 and the pass mark at 180 is most people will need to secure work outside of the Auckland region. For some, they won't. For some, we'll be able to make that 180 points in Auckland, but for most, it will be outside. You do have to speak English, <clears throat> uh, which for most of you shouldn't be a problem. Um, in fact, for all of you really shouldn't be a problem, but that is done through an English language test. So IELTS, Pearson test, um, there's actually five different tests you can use. And I've never had, I've, I've had one client in 16 years who hasn't passed that test. Um, they passed it on the second run. So it's often not the English ability that's, in, um, that's difficult or a question, it's more a test. You know, many of us haven't been tested for years and years, and then suddenly there we are <clears throat> having to do a test and make things a bit uh, nerve-wracking. Um, but for most people, passing their test first run, first time around is absolutely fine. We do have health and character assessments. Um, so you have to be of good health, but you don't have to be a triathlete. Um, and you have to be a good character, but you don't have to be a saint. So the most important thing there for us <clears throat> as advisors helping people through the process is that we need to know about that stuff. The more we know, um, whether it might be a conviction from your past or a health condition that you, you need to manage, the more we know, the better we can advise you. And in terms of health, it has to be something fairly significant to stop someone getting a visa. Um, and also the same for character. So they are tricky. You know, if you have any of those issues, we have to deal with them and we have to manage them through the process. But unless they're really, really significant, they generally can be dealt with. So as we said, for most applicants, employment outside of Auckland is required, um, but there is no requirement to be on a shortage list. So we often talk about, or you might have heard of things like the long-term skills shortage list or the green list. Under this particular category, you don't have to be on a shortage list of any description, but you do need to have a job that is skilled. And skilled is defined very, very broadly for this category. So it can be, and so it's certainly not starting at the bottom, but someone like a secretary or a personal assistant all the way through to an astronaut or an engineer. All of those jobs in between are considered skilled. That includes the trades, it includes professional roles, it includes middle management. This is a really, really big list of what we consider skilled for this particular category. Um, 
and you need to have relevant experience or qualifications to that job. So if you're an accountant and you come to New Zealand and you secure a job as a uh, IT wizard, unless you have experience, work experience or qualifications in that occupation, you won't qualify, even if it's a really good job with a really good salary. You do need to earn a certain salary here. So we base everything in New Zealand on the median wage, um, which at the moment is $27.76 an hour, about 56,000 a year. That increases to 29.96 or 29.66, can't remember, um, in February. So it goes up or changes every six to 12 months. Um, for most people who are skilled and have good experience or a good qualification and are employable, it is not, <clears throat> there's not a number to worry about. It's not um, unobtainable at all. In fact, very obtainable, particularly in the current market where skills are really, really short um, and we need lots of people. The salaries are generally very good and reflective of that demand. So it's a two-part process for that skilled micro category point system. You file an expression of interest once you have the points you need or you think you have them. Um, and then you go into a poll and then you're selected and it will be monthly selections from January. It's really important that you make sure that the points you think you can claim are the points you can claim. So you have to make sure you've got the right level of points and you've claimed them correctly. It's very easy to get that process wrong. Um, but for most of you, in order to get those 180 points, obviously the job offer is a really crucial part of that process. So the skilled migrant category generally involves two parts. So the job search, coming over, securing a job and a work visa to work in that role, and then followed by the residence process with the points claim. Because your residence will take a good nine to 12 months to process, maybe even a bit longer, um, and you need the job offer to get the points, then obviously no employer is going to wait around for a year. So the work visa enables you to start the job and then wait out effectively the residence process. So that's the, <clears throat> the skilled migrant category for points, um, which is coming up the change, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but before we do that, we'll get to the other skilled migrant category called skilled migrant residence. So this is not a points-based system. Um, this was introduced as part of what immigration referred to as the rebalance, kind of a post-COVID reopening process where they <clears throat> effectively had to target really important jobs and bring them in quickly. Um, I could talk for uh, an hour or two on whether or not the government and the immigration system works well and has the right um, kind of idea. Uh, but in terms of this, I think it was a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to quickly opening the borders and opening up to the world and needing to bring people in very, very quickly. So it operates basically on kind of two things, really. There is a green list, um, and a green list is a list of occupations that are in high demand. So we are very short of and we critically, critically need. Uh, and then there is the other side of it, which is based on salary. So in order to qualify for one of these visas, <clears throat> and there are effectively three, um, you need to either have a job offer in New Zealand in, on the green list or a job offer in New Zealand paying twice the median salary. So at the moment, that would be a job paying about 116000 thereabouts. Um, that will increase to 123000 next year from February. So if you're on the green list, there are two parts to that. So we have two, uh, the green list is split into two parts. There is a tier one of the green list and a tier two. There's actually a lot of occupations on there. Um, it includes things like nurses, engineers, IT professionals, um, teachers. There's a whole range of jobs on the list, but some are in tier one of that list and some are in tier two. And the biggest difference with those two tiers is that if you have a job offer excuse me, <clears throat> on tier one of the list, so on the top tier, um, you can apply for what's called straight to residence. So you can effectively get the job and apply for residence immediately. Um, that residence application will take between one and two months to process, depending on health, character, and all those assessments. You don't necessarily have to um, have a work visa for that process because if you get offered the job and the employer is willing to wait, you could apply straight for residence and go straight ahead. Um, it's actually really, really fast and, and 
uh, unusual because we don't normally do things that quickly. Um, <clears throat> but it's a really good a really good option if you're in one of those high demand occupations. The second tier of that list, so tier two, <clears throat> is for um, a whole bunch of occupations which are in demand, but what we're going to do is we're not going to let them apply for the straight residence pathway. We, <clears throat> we allow them to apply after two years. So effectively, you get the job, you secure the work visa, and then you apply after being on that work visa for two years working in that role. It doesn't have to be the, a single employer, it could be multiple employers along that two years, as long as you stay in that occupation that's on that list, or that was on that list at the beginning of the two year period. So <clears throat> occupations come on and off that list periodically, so the list is uh, adjusted depending on what we need. So you've got your straight to residence pathway if you're on tier one of the list, or your two year uh, for want of a better word, <clears throat> work to residence pathway if you're on tier two of that list. If you happen to be in a high salary uh, role, so pay twice the median salary, you do not have to be on the green list at all. So <clears throat> you can be in a job that's, that doesn't occupy a place on that list, but as long as you're earning that salary, you get a two year, or you actually get a three year work visa, you work in that role for two years, and then you apply for residence, a little bit like that tier two but the job doesn't have to be on that um, on that list at all. So basically three, <clears throat> three visa options under that particular pathway. Um, it was introduced in September. It is still very, very new, um, but we are seeing applicants coming through. And it's, I think, hasn't been promoted or talked about as much as it could be. Um, I think it's a really good option for those who are on that list to have an occupation and experience in that list. Um, or those who can potentially earn that higher salary level. So work, effectively a work to residence pathway for most, or a direct straight to residence pathway for some. Um, and if you can secure residence in one or two months under the straight to residence pathway, possibly is the fastest way to secure residence in almost any country. Um, so again, targeted at very specific in-demand occupations or those earning twice the median income and those lists are updated. But it's important to bear in mind if you're on the list at the beginning of the work visa period um, or when you applied for straight to residence, then you stay on that list. So there is a, a sort of a transitional part of that as well. So that's the current skilled migrant category as it stands, um, <clears throat> um, at least until mid-2023. So what we know so far is that in mid-2023, the skilled migrant residents, the second part of that slide that's there now, the not points-based process, will continue. Um, there's no uh, plans to change that at this point. The occupations might change that are on the list, but this is kind of bedded in. The points-based system, so the top part of the screen is set to change, and that's going to look a little bit like this. So the future of the skilled migrant category points-based system, <clears throat> which the government announced in October, will or, or proposed changes in October of this year, um, which have been discussed and debated and consulted upon. So at this point, these changes are not fixed in stone, they're not hard and fast, um, but they potentially will come into play in what I think will be a very similar way to what's on screen at the moment. It's a little bit complicated to explain, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll try and do my best. Um, effectively, the government's done two things here. They've tried to simplify it all. So instead of having 16 different things you can get points for, they've essentially made it two things. Um, <clears throat> so they've tried to simplify it, but they've also, in the same breath, um, turned this more into a work to residence process rather than a direct to residence process. So for most people who qualify under this category, they will need to work in New Zealand for a period of one year, two year, or possibly three years, but more likely one or two years for most people in order to qualify. So the way it works is that you get points from two different things and you need to get a total of six points. So <clears throat> you get points from the blue box one of those three columns, not, not all of them, just one of them, and then you top up your points from the small red box on the right. Um, and you'll see the small red box on the right is, sorry, someone said my slide is minimized. Uh, it looks okay on the screen sharing, but hopefully everyone can see it. 
Um, <clears throat> so you, the small red box on the right is the New Zealand work experience, which effectively tops up what you might claim on the left. So if we started basically with, let's say, for example, someone who had a PhD um, in anything, really, <clears throat> doesn't really matter what they might have, they would get six points for that PhD, and that six points is enough. However, they must also have a job offer, be no older than 56 years of age or 55 years of age. So the minute they turn 56, it's all over. Uh, <clears throat> meet health and character requirements as well. So meet some basic rules, have a job offer and have the PhD. Um, if, however, that person had a bachelor's degree and a job offer and they were no older than 55 um, and met health and character, they would get three points for the bachelor's degree. So they would effectively need to top that up with three years of New Zealand experience. That is work in New Zealand for a period of three years in that skill role or an A skill role. And then that would give them um, six points in total at the end of that three years. So we might choose an alternative one. So if you're a doctor, for example, which takes six years of, of training to become registered, <clears throat> then you would get six points from that blue box on the left. Um, and then you would not have to top up with work experience. So you'd basically get the six points with the job offer straight away. If you uh, were registered in a trade, for example, um, uh, an electrician or a plumber, and it took you three or four years to secure your, or less than three years to secure your professional registration, then you would get three points and you would top that up with work experience. And then finally, <clears throat> depending on your salary, for example, if you earn three times the median wage, which would be somewhere in the region of about $185,000 a year, so very high salary, um, you would get six points, um, and that would allow you to apply straight away. Um, if you were earning 1.5 times the median wage, which would be <clears throat> somewhere in the region of about 85,000, you would get three points and that person would need to then top themselves up with three years of experience. So you can kind of see how this works. The more, um, <clears throat> the more time it took you to secure your registration or your qualification or the higher the income you can earn, the less New Zealand work experience you need to top up with. I think overall, it's not a bad plan, I think, and it would, could work very well for many people. So there'll still be a lot of people who qualify under this. <clears throat> but if, if it were me and I was interested in making this move, when I was thinking about, you know, how do I do it? I think better the devil you know than the one you don't. And the current 180 points pass mark is very clear. If you qualify, even if you have a bachelor's degree, for example, or you're a plumber or an electrician, you can apply with the job offer and go straight away. And in this particular proposed category in the future, you're looking at maybe having to work for one or two years. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you can apply for residence sooner, why wouldn't you? <clears throat> so for me, overall, this proposal is not the worst thing in the world, but also there is an opportunity for the next eight months or so to take advantage of a slightly faster way of doing this. I, I suspect there will be some changes to this proposal. Um, I certainly have submitted, and I know lots of industry colleagues have submitted changes or proposed changes to this, because we'd like to see it slightly differently, take away the work experience, maybe give people residence conditional upon them staying in a job for a period of time. Lots of different ways we can do it. Um, so I think there may be some changes to this, but I think overall, the plan is probably fairly, fairly solid. All right, <clears throat> so we're racing ahead, which is good. Um, so to, I think if we were talking about what makes a successful migration journey and having done this for a long time, 16 years, I've been helping people to make this move. Um, there's a few things that I would recommend. So <clears throat> it's, it's really about setting the right level of expectation. This is a massive thing to do. It's a really big move for yourself your family, it's an emotional move, it's a logistically complicated move, and it's financially challenging as well. If you want to do this, you want to do it right, and you want to do it the first time. You don't want to be repeating this process because it is costly. So, you know, you don't get 99% of a visa, you either get it or you don't. So if I had some basic advice, number one would be to be prepared. 
No, from the very start to the very end, <clears throat> being prepared for what might happen or what might not happen along the way is really, really important. Um, having a plan and setting out the plan from the start is crucial and knowing that along the way and along that plan, things might change. <clears throat> you know, there might be some surprises and you can never account for absolutely anything, everything, but you do need to have a good, solid plan and the steps involved. And also as part of that plan is making sure you've got your documentation prepared, <clears throat> you're ready for the job market, you know where to look because, and I, I can give you a very quick example, I had a really um, qualified mechanic um, as a client of mine several years ago, lots of experience, very employable, and I said to him, you will find work very quickly and you'll probably find work even while you're offshore. Um, most people have to come here to explore the market to find the job. And they did say them, your biggest challenge is not so much finding work, but it's being ready for when that happens. Because if an employer offers you a job, you need to be in a position to be able to apply for the visa reasonably quickly. Employers want people to start fairly fast. Um, so be ready for that process, be prepared for that process. And of course, we started with him. Um, problem is that he sort of did the job offer, a job search before he did the document uh, part of the process. <clears throat> and sure enough, he secured not one, but three potential roles while he was still sitting in South Africa. And the challenge we then had was getting everything organised, getting all the paperwork. And as you know, if you're in South Africa, um, the Department of Home Affairs can take forever um, to secure or to secure the documentation you need. So in short, we managed to make that work, but it's about timing everything because that was reasonably stressful. We had an employer waiting for him to turn up. He was waiting for the visa process to happen and he didn't have the paperwork. So we like to try and time things really carefully. Start with getting everything organized, getting the paperwork ready, getting the process underway, and then starting the job search. And, and knowing where to look and how to look and what to say to employers, all part of that preparation. Second piece of advice <clears throat> is to enjoy the adventure. You know, it is a challenging process, it's a, but it is also exciting and rewarding. And try and enjoy the ups and the downs. You know, you're moving to another country for a better life. And you need to, and while it is challenging and it does have its ups and downs, you also need to enjoy that and, and be excited about it as well. Um, you know, otherwise, what's the point? A lot of my clients do this or, or tell me that the main reason they're doing this is for their children, and I understand that, and that makes perfect sense. But you also need to do this for yourself. Um, you need to be <clears throat> willing to make the move for your own benefit as well as for your children as well. Otherwise, the family moves, mum and dad aren't happy, and things don't work out that well. So, you know, um, do it because you want to do it. Do it because you're doing it for your family, but also understand that... Um, and, and it's something I've put at the end of the slide, but I'll jump to it. Nobody can convince you to make the move. It's your decision and yours alone. You can read lots of different Facebook posts. You can read lots of forums, chat groups, all sorts of things. Um, and the reality is, um, while people will give you their opinions or what New Zealand is like or not like, um, you have to make that decision. It's your move, not their move. Take the advice. <clears throat> so... We offer advice and we, we don't just do the visa process. I mean, I my job is two parts. One, it is to process and manage the visa applications and that's the technical part of it. Um, but the other part is to encourage, to set the right expectations, to tell my clients what they need to know. You know I don't just tell people what they want to hear um, because making this move successfully doesn't work that way. We have to tell you everything you need to know, the good parts and the bad parts. And if I think one of my clients is not doing what I need them to do, I'm very quick to put them on the right track. But, but if you pay for advice, certainly if you pay for someone like me <clears throat> to help you through this process, use it. You know, um, don't use the bits that you think are useful. Use all of it. We know how this works. We've been doing it a long time. And often we know a little bit more about what this move involves than you might know. And finally, be prepared for change. You know, the visa process, particularly in the last couple of years, is a fluid one. 
Um, and when you've got a plan, uh, sometimes you'll have to change direction, you'll have to do things a little bit differently because that process will change. Thankfully, for most people, and even over the last two and a half years when we've had so many changes, the migrants and the clients that I started with are still moving their way through the process. Some <clears throat> admittedly a little bit sooner than others because of this skilled migrant category change and that window of opportunity being available. Um, but you know, having a plan, being prepared to change the plan if you need to, and also useful to have someone who can help you navigate those changes is, is really important. Um, sometimes things happen and you don't know they've happened until it's too late. Um, so someone who's in advance of that or able to explain what those changes mean to you can be very useful. All right, <clears throat> so we're nearly near the hour. So I hope that today has given you a really basic outline of what's involved, the steps, the, the options available. And for most of you, that will be the skilled migrant category. Um, and also bear in mind that for most of you, the I guess the, the next eight months will be a really important period because we've got those changes in process or changes in policy coming along. Um, and so if you want to take advantage of the existing rules, that would be the way to do it, would be to do it sooner rather than later. If you are interested in moving this ahead and going to, you know, I guess the next stage, um, the next stage for us is to do a one-to-one -one assessment with you, which essentially is where you complete a more comprehensive form than the one you completed for the seminar registration. We go over those details, we establish whether you qualify or not and the plan that's involved. Um, and then what we do is once we've got that plan, we have a one-to-one -one discussion, usually 60 to 90 minutes. We don't kind of put a, a set time frame on it. Um, it's how long it takes to talk through your process. And we explain how the visas will work, the steps involved for you, but we also talk about things like your employability, healthcare, education, pretty much anything that's important to your potential move. And the whole idea is for you to get to know us a little bit better, for us to get to know your situation, but to give you a plan, a roadmap as to how this thing might work for you. Um, and if you want to book that in, we will be sending out an email at the end of the seminar for you to book, or you can just email myself. Some of you will have received emails from me already. <clears throat> you can just reply to that email and we can book you in. I normally do these my morning, um, which equates to your evening for most of you, but we're flexible, and it's on a first come, first serve basis. All right, so I've got a few questions here that um, people have sent in. If you do have questions, just pop them into the chat, uh, the chat window, and then we can get uh, that organized and go through those questions. But the questions that I do have, pretty common themes. So let me just pull up a couple and we'll go through them. Um, I've got about sort of 10 minutes or so to work through these. Uh, where are we? Here we go. All right, so <clears throat> first question I've had is, is English mandatory? Uh, English testing mandatory? Yes. English testing is mandatory for applicants under most categories, apart from the partnership visa category that does not have mandatory English testing involved. Um, but for pretty much everything else, there is uh, mandatory English testing. And again, five different um, test options that you can choose. The pass marks are not that hard. Um, I think if you work or have studied in English, <clears throat> very achievable to, to meet those requirements. Um, there is training available as well for English tuition. We can point you in the right direction of people who can assist with that English process and getting you ready for it. And we also offer some basic guides and instructions on, on how to tackle that test. All right, here we go. Um, good question here. Do you get extra points if you have family uh, living in New Zealand? And um, this one is cousin. Uh, no is the short answer. So <clears throat> under the skilled migrant category, there are no points awarded for family. There used to be, uh, we used to get points for direct family. So um, brothers, sisters, parents, and um, children. We don't offer that anymore, and I think largely that was taken away because most uh, most of the time um, having family here is useful, but it doesn't really make a difference to your employability or your ability to settle in the country. 
Um, and so, so unfortunately, having family here doesn't help with the point. What I would say, though, is that having family here does help in a different way, and that is in terms of settling into the country. Um, having someone you know here, even if it's family or friends, makes a pretty big difference uh, in terms of your ability to settle in <clears throat> um, and establish yourself. If you know someone here, they can kind of guide you through the process. A uh, really good example, a um, bit of an ironic example, is I had uh, friends of mine, or sorry, clients of mine who moved. They had friends living in a particular part of the country. And so <clears throat> they're very desperate to live in that part of the country specifically. Um, and they ended up doing that, and, and now they've ended up buying a house together. Um, you know, so it does it does help and it does work, but it doesn't give you any points. Uh, <clears throat> what is the level for English teaching or lecturing? So I'm not quite sure what that means, um, but what I would say, <clears throat> the level required for English is kind of rate uh, or graded, I guess, in terms of proficient or superior. Um, those are Australian terms, but basically we want all of our skilled migrant applicants um, to have a proficient level of English, which means you can read, you can write, you can speak uh, and listen in English to a fairly normal level. Um, so you can conduct yourself, you can work, you can kind of interact on a pretty <clears throat> average basis. It's not a high level, so it's not academic English, so to speak. It's more conversational, regular use English. Uh, how much roughly is the SNC visa application process is, and how much is the one-to-one -one consulta consultation fee? Um, <clears throat> so for the one-to-one -one consultation, I don't charge for that. Um, we do charge, obviously, a, a, a fee to assist people, but what we tend to do is we provide a quote to those people during the consultation once we've established they qualify and which category they qualify under. So first thing to do is work out, do you actually qualify for the visa and which pathway can we use? And then once we know that, we will establish a quote of costs for you. Um, and that quote of cost will cover the visa process, the application fees, but we also go a little bit further um, and give you kind of a whole budget. Now, what will this cost a family of four or, or two or one or three to make the move? Flights? Um, settling in money, uh, everything you need basically to to consider making the adjustment, um, and it's not cheap. You know, the I, I won't sugarcoat that. It's an expensive process. You have to be financially prepared to do this. <clears throat> so we'll give you a budget to work with, and you can plan that. Thankfully, um, in almost all cases, you can spread that cost out over the timeline. So it's not paid up front. <clears throat> it's a process where we kind of stagger costs and stagger fees. How long does it, process, does it take to process a work visa? It's a very good question. So at the moment, um, it takes around about four to six weeks to process a work visa um, from start to finish. That's assuming you've got all the right paperwork in place and the application is ready to go. Um, and, and that's really important. You know, applications often take a lot longer than they should, not because of immigration's time frame or because of delays with the system, but because the applicant hasn't provided all of the right information up front. And so it's really important that we get that application, what we call decision ready, um, which means you've put it all in uh, up front, immigration can pick it up and make a decision really quickly. That will lead to a much smoother, much faster application process. <clears throat> and, and really that's what the preparation phase is all about. It's making sure you're prepared for that process when it happens, you what we call job search ready and visa ready. Uh, and then another follow-up question, one more before we wrap up. Um, what, how long does it take to process a residence application? Okay, so a work visa, four to five weeks, um, residence much, much longer, although it depends on the category you're applying under. So if we go down the straight to residence process, that could be a couple of months if you're in one of those occupations. If you're going down the skilled migrant category process, it could be nine to 12 months, maybe even longer. And the biggest reason for that is it's a bit of a backlog with applications at the moment. There's a lot of people wanting to apply um, and really not enough immigration officers to process them, which is you know a little bit of a pain. But um, the most important thing, and I often say this to clients, or clients will say, can you give me the visa quicker than anyone else? And my response to that is, no, we can't. 
Um, but what we can do is we can make it a little bit quicker because we've put forward the right application, the right documents. And so it's well prepared. <clears throat> Immigration can basically, when they get to it and pick it up, they can make a decision on it really quickly. Uh, me. Sorry, there's one more question actually, which I'll ask. Um, can you work while waiting for that visa? Uh, so I think the question there is, if you are in New Zealand on a visitor visa and you're looking for a job, which is often what people do, they come to New Zealand, they fire on a visitor visa, and it's not unlawful to do that, by the way. Um, it's perfectly lawful to come to New Zealand as a visitor to look for work. You just have to be um, careful in how you apply for the visitor visa and be upfront about your intentions, but also provide the right kind of evidence to show that you have a pathway to a longer term visa. So if you're here and you come across on a visitor visa, can you work while you're waiting for the work visa to be approved? The short answer is no. So you have to make sure you get the work visa, then commence working. Um, and again, the shorter the work visa process is, the faster you get into the job and the faster you earn a living. And that's you know, all part of being prepared, really making sure you, <clears throat> you can apply for the visa with all the right documents and minimize that time frame. Great, so I think that's covered a fair few questions. Um, and I know it's getting a bit later on your side for those of you that are on the other side of the planet. So I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you all very much for attending. Um, I will be sending out the consultation email shortly um, and then you can respond to that and get in touch and we will book you in. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening and um, we'll hopefully talk to some of you soon. Thank you.